Greetings, listeners of Stock Explorers, and welcome to uh, another focused exploration. Great to be here. The recent shifts in the market, I mean, particularly following those announcements about new tariffs, they've well understandably created a pretty complex environment for investment decisions. Oh, absolutely. So today we're undertaking a deep dive into Enovix Corporation, that's ticker ENVX. It's a company that um, presents both some intriguing possibilities and, frankly, notable volatility for potential investors trying to navigate these times. Indeed. Yeah, the investment landscape has certainly become more, let's say, nuanced, especially in the wake of these trade policy changes. Right. That initial implementation of the 10% baseline tariff, the one covering a wide array of imports back on April 5th, that was a significant development. Mm -hmm. And you know, while the subsequent 90-day pause on those uh, initially proposed reciprocal import taxes offered a bit of a temporary reprieve from you know, further immediate escalation, that initial 10% tariff, it's still there. It remains a factor to consider. Absolutely. So, OK, against this backdrop, this kind of evolving trade dynamic, our goal today is really to provide you with a clearer understanding of the core aspects of Univix. What's most critical for your investment considerations? Makes sense. We've seen the stock's journey, right? including that recent dip to a 52-week low this April and, well, an overall downward trend since late March. But, you know, the market also kind of whispers about potential undervaluation. Right. So let's maybe start by unpacking this tariff situation and its possible implications for Enovix. Yeah, logical starting point. As you mentioned, that 10% baseline tariff is, is now in effect. So when we think about Enovix's operational footprint, it's distinctly global. Okay. Their Fab 2 facility that's in Malaysia serves as a key high-volume manufacturing hub. Yeah. And uh, furthermore, their strategic acquisitions have established a presence in South Korea, too. Oh, okay. South Korea as well. Yeah. The Root Jade acquisition brought valuable vertical integration, an experienced team, which is huge. And the Solar Edge facility, that's anticipated to significantly bolster their production capacity, mm. particularly relevant maybe for the defense sector. Mm. And those enhancements are expected right around now, actually, April 2025. So given that manufacturing in Malaysia and South Korea, I mean, it seems reasonable to assume this 10 percent tariff could influence the cost of their products or maybe components entering the U.S. Could do. Yeah. But that 90 day pause on other tariffs, maybe that gives them a window, a chance to evaluate, potentially adjust supply chains. Precisely. And what's particularly interesting to note here is that J.P. Morgan uh, recently identified Enovix as a clean tech pick, one that appears relatively shielded from sort of near-term election-related uncertainties. Oh, interesting. Why is that? Well, largely due to their strategic emphasis on the Asian market. So this suggests their globally diversified approach, right, with manufacturing and key target markets in Asia could serve as maybe a partial buffer against the immediate headwinds of these trade policies. Okay, so not complete insulation, but... Exactly. Not complete but it provides a degree of strategic advantage. That raises a really important point. It sounds like their global strategy isn't just about scaling production. It might also be a proactive way to navigate these, well, complexities of international trade. Could very well be part of it. Okay, so moving on then, let's delve into the core of Univix's proposition, their battery technology. We keep hearing about these silicon anode lithium ion batteries. What actually makes them stand out? Right, this is where the potential disruption lies. Enovix's fundamental innovation, it centers around their 100% active silicon anode lithium ion batteries. Okay, 100% active silicon. Yeah. Traditional lithium ion batteries, they typically use graphite anodes. Silicon, at least theoretically, has a significantly higher capacity to store lithium compared to graphite. Right. Which translates potentially to much greater energy density. The challenge historically there has been the... Uh, the substantial volume changes silicon undergoes, you know, during charging and discharging, it leads to rapid battery degradation. Ah, okay. The swelling issue. Exactly. But Enovix asserts that their proprietary cell architecture and their manufacturing processes have effectively mitigated this issue. They claim their batteries can achieve roughly 30% higher energy density. 30%. Yeah, and faster charging times compared to conventional batteries. Oh, a 30% improvement in energy density. That's that's a considerable leap. Yeah. For anyone who's, you know, struggled with smartphone battery life or waited ages for devices to charge, the appeal there is pretty immediate. Exactly right. Think about the increasing demand for power in our mobile devices. You've yeah. got AI-driven smartphones, advanced wearables, um, those immersive experiences from mixed reality headsets. Yeah, they all need more juice. They all require more energy usually in smaller, lighter packages. 
This is sort of the sweet spot for Enovix's tech. And importantly, the fact that their silicon battery production process is protected by proprietary methods, that could be a significant barrier to entry for competitors trying to replicate it. Good point. And this isn't just theoretical, right? They actually have battery products being developed for these markets. Correct. Yeah, they've been actively developing two generations of these high energy density smartphone batteries. They call them EX1M and EX2M. Okay. And notably, sample production of the EX1M is actually underway right now at their facility in Malaysia. Oh, samples already. Samples already. And they've set specific performance targets, aiming for around uh, 1,000 full charge and discharge cycles. Right. Plus meeting those really stringent fast charging requirements that smartphone manufacturers demand. Right. Those benchmarks are critical, aren't they? To show it's actually viable in the real world. Absolutely critical for demonstrating viability and, well, market readiness. So they're not just, you know, boasting impressive specs, they're focused on meeting the practical demands. Okay, let's revisit that global manufacturing strategy. It sounds like they've been quite strategic expanding. Indeed. Fab2 in Malaysia, that's their primary high volume line. And starting the EX1M sample production there back in June 2024 was a pretty significant step towards commercialization. Mm -hmm. Then their expansion into South Korea via those acquisitions is also noteworthy. Root Jade, that brought in like over two decades of established battery manufacturing expertise. That can be invaluable for streamlining their own processes. Yeah, that experience matters. It really does. And the Solar Edge facility acquisition, that's interesting because it aims partly to address the growing needs of the defense sector, yeah. which often has very specific, very demanding battery criteria. Sure. They anticipate that facility enhancing their overall capacity right around this time frame. And it seems they're not just building their own infrastructure, they're also forming alliances. Tell us more about this partnership with Elentech Co. Ah, yes, Elentech. This collaboration is, I think, a crucial element of their strategy. Elentech Co. is a well-established Asian manufacturer of battery packs, mm. primarily for consumer electronics. Okay. And importantly, their client list includes major players. Samsung, for instance. Oh, okay. Samsung. Yeah. So this partnership, it's formalized through an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding. It gives Enovix access to Olentech's deep knowledge in battery pack design, plus their extensive large-scale manufacturing capabilities. Right. So not just the cell, but the whole pack assembly. Exactly. This could provide Enovix with a much more efficient path to integrate their cells into end-user products and you know scale their market reach faster. So, okay, while Samsung isn't directly named as an Enovix customer in the info we have, this connection through Elentech, it could be an indirect route or maybe a future opportunity to get their batteries into Samsung devices. Precisely. It establishes an indirect link, at least, to a major global OEM. Now, beyond their manufacturing work, it's vital to look at their success in actually translating the tech into, you know, tangible commercial agreements. And it looks like they have made progress there, securing several key agreements across different sectors. Yes, and these agreements are strong indicators of market validation for their technology, I'd say. Within the smartphone market specifically, they've secured agreements with two of the top eight global smartphone OEMs. Two of the top eight. Okay. Yeah. And notably, one of these is identified as a top five OEM in China, with product launches anticipated in Q4 2025. Wow, a top five in China. The sheer scale of that market makes that a particularly significant win, doesn't it? Undeniably, yeah. The Chinese smartphone market is a massive opportunity. So what about other potential applications? Beyond smartphones. They're also gaining traction in that uh, burgeoning mixed reality space. Mm -hmm. They've entered into an agreement with a leading tech company based in California. Okay. To supply both their silicon batteries and the integrated battery packs for a mixed reality headset. And this is a market projected for really substantial growth in the coming years. Right. MRR headsets are definitely a hot area. It's exactly. Industry forecasts suggest a big jump in unit shipments. Maybe under 10 million this year to over 35 million by 2028. So, by securing a foothold here, Edivix is positioning itself for potential exponential growth. And their ambitions seem to extend even beyond consumer electronics. That's correct. They've initiated a development agreement with a prominent automaker. An automaker. For EVs. To evaluate and validate their battery architecture for use in electric vehicles, yes. 
Now, this is currently in the early stages, right? Development and validation. But the immense potential of the EV market, projected to surpass half a trillion dollars by 2040, makes this a potentially transformative long-term prospect for Inovix. Huge potential there. Huge. And then that MOU with Alentech Cost, that's intended as a long-term collaboration in battery pack manufacturing, too, further underpinning their global expansion across all these diverse applications. Okay, so they're really strategically targeting multiple high growth sectors at the same time. That diversification could be a significant strength. Let's uh, let's turn our attention now to their financial performance and maybe future growth expectations. Okay, financials. Examining the recent results, the revenue growth is certainly noteworthy. They reported $9.7 million in revenue for Q4 2024. Okay. Bringing their total revenue for the full year to $23.1 million. That represents an impressive a uh, 202% increase compared to the previous year, signaling strong initial market traction. 202% year over year. Wow. And they even beat analyst expectations recently. Yes. Their reported earnings per share and revenue for that quarter, they both surpassed the analyst consensus estimates, which, you know, is generally viewed favorably by investors. However, their projection for the current quarter, Q1 2025, is expected to be somewhat lower, somewhere between $3.5 and $5.5 million. Should investors be concerned by that sequential decrease? Well, it's important to interpret this in context, right? The context of their ongoing production scaling efforts. During these phases, ramping up manufacturing for higher volumes, it's actually not uncommon to see some variability in quarterly revenue. Ah, oh, okay. So typical ramp up fluctuations. Could be. This fluctuation doesn't necessarily indicate a fundamental setback. It's more characteristic of this stage of growth. Now, while the Annual revenue growth is significant. It's also important to acknowledge the company is currently operating at a loss. Right. They reported both a gap net loss, that's the standard accounting measure, and an adjusted EBITDA loss, which looks more at operating profitability for Q4 2024. Okay. However, the fact that the adjusted EBITDA loss showed an improvement compared to the prior quarter does suggest some progress in their operational efficiency. But they do seem to have a robust financial position cash-wise. Indeed. Yeah, they finished 2024 with a strong cash position, around $273 million. Plus, they raised $100 million in capital during 2024. How'd they do that? Stock issuance. Yeah, through issuing new stock. Represented about 6% of their outstanding shares. So this capital infusion, combined with their existing reserves, it provides them with a financial runway that could potentially extend into 2026. Okay, into 2026. And the company anticipates achieving profitability somewhere around that time frame. So, okay, while they are currently losing money, this seems to be part of that growth investment phase. And they've secured the capital to potentially reach profitability. And the long-term growth forecasts look pretty compelling. You do. Analysts' forecasts point to substantial growth in both earnings and revenue in the coming years. We're talking around 48% and 43.8% per annum, respectively. Wow. Earnings per share also projected to increase significantly. And the return on equity is expected to be quite robust within the next three years. These are the kinds of growth metrics that often underpin arguments for a stock being, you know, currently undervalued. And it seems the general feeling among financial analysts kind of aligns with this positive long-term outlook, despite the recent stock price dips. That's correct. The consensus rating from analysts typically ranges from, say, moderate buy to strong buy. And their average price targets are significantly higher than the current trading price. Any examples? Sure. Cantor Fitzgerald has an overweight rating with a $30 target. Uh, JP Morgan, while they recently adjusted their target down to $15, they still maintain an overweight rating. So these targets suggest considerable potential upside, according to these analysts anyway. Right. So there's this perceived disconnect between the current market price and the anticipated future growth, plus what analysts are saying. OK, let's address the volatility we mentioned at the start. What factors might be contributing to these pretty significant swings in Univix's stock price? Well, a significant contributing factor is definitely the elevated level of short interest in Univix's stock. Ah, the shorts. Yeah. As of the latest data, a substantial portion of the company's publicly traded shares, nearly 30% of the float, which is the shares available for public trading, were held by short sellers. Almost a third. That's high. It is high. And that figure has actually increased recently. The short interest ratio, sometimes called days to cover, is also relatively high at 73 Okay, what does that mean, 7.3 days to cover? It indicates that it would take, theoretically, over seven days of average trading volume for all those short sellers to cover their positions by buying back the stock. Right. 
This situation can create the potential for a rapid upward price movement, what's known as a short squeeze. Right, if good news hits. Exactly. If positive news or some catalyst emerges, short sellers might rush to close their positions, buying stock, which further drives up demand and the price. So this high short interest basically creates a scenario where good news could trigger a really rabid, significant price jump. And the information we saw also categorized the stock as high risk because of its daily price volatility. Yes, the average daily volatility has been quite pronounced, around 9-10% in some recent periods. This inherent volatility, well, it can make the stock a potentially bumpy investment, particularly for those with maybe a shorter time horizon. Definitely something to be aware of. Yeah, it underscores the importance of understanding your own risk tolerance if you're considering investing in Enovix. Speaking of those involved with the company, who's actually leading Enovix, and what does the ownership structure look like? That can often give some insight into leadership and maybe long-term stability. Sure. The president and CEO is Dr. Raj Taluri. He took over in early 2023, and he brings a wealth of relevant experience, mostly from the semiconductor and mobile tech sectors. Oh, where from? He held significant leadership positions at major companies like Micron and Qualcomm. So his background in high-volume manufacturing for portable electronics seems particularly well aligned with Inovix's strategic focus. Okay. Yeah, that sounds like a good fit. And what about major shareholders? Any significant insider holdings, like from the management uh, team? Yes, insider ownership is quite notable. It's at 15.70%. 15%? That's pretty high. It is. And that level of insider stake can often be viewed positively by investors, right? It tends to align the interests of the company's leadership with the shareholders. Skin in the game. Exactly. And it can potentially contribute to greater stability in the ownership structure, especially during periods of market uncertainty like now. There are also significant holdings by institutional investors, which is, you know, pretty typical for a company at this stage with high growth aspirations. Okay, so to try and synthesize all of this, what are the key investment considerations for someone looking at Inovix right now, especially considering the tariffs and the broader market environment? Yeah, it's really a blend, isn't it? The investment case for Enovix presents this mix of compelling potential and um, inherent risks. Their innovative silicon anotech offers a distinct advantage, potentially, in energy density and charging speed. That positions them favorably in rapidly expanding markets, advanced mobile mixed reality. Right, the tech upside. Yeah. Their strategic partnerships, the progress they've made setting up global manufacturing, those are also encouraging signs. However, investors also have to acknowledge the company is currently operating at a net loss. They have a significant cash burn rate. But they have the runway, you said. They do appear to have sufficient capital to reach their projected profitability timeline, yes. But the stock's high volatility, partly influenced by that substantial short interest, it just adds another layer of risk. And while their focus on the Asian market might mitigate some immediate impact from the recent U.S. tariffs, it's still a factor to keep monitoring. So it really boils down to weighing that potential for disruptive technological growth against the inherent risks that come with a pre-profitability tech company operating in what is a pretty dynamic global economic landscape. Precisely. For individuals considering an investment, I think adopting a long-term perspective seems crucial. Given the substantial projected growth in earnings and revenue, and that anticipated transition to profitability in the coming years, yeah. the successful execution of their manufacturing scale-up, and converting those existing commercial agreements into significant sustained revenue streams, those will be the critical determinants of their future success, I believe. Indeed. A great deal to consider there. Inovix certainly presents a fascinating case study, doesn't it? Right at the intersection of tech innovation, global market forces, and financial growth. It'll be very interesting to watch how these factors play out in the months and years ahead. Absolutely. It's a company with potential for transformative technology in markets with significant upside. But, you know, as with any investment, thorough consideration of both the opportunities and the risks is essential particularly within the context of this evolving global economic landscape. Well said. Okay, that concludes our in-depth exploration of Enovix for today. We trust this has provided you, our Stock Explorers listeners, with a uh, more comprehensive understanding of the key aspects to consider. Indeed. Thanks for joining us for this deep dive. And to all of you tuning in, if you found this analysis valuable, please do subscribe to Stock Explorers. Uh, give this deep dive a like and definitely activate those notifications so you don't miss our future in-depth market analyses. Until our next exploration, thank you for listening.